Schatz, and you're listening to Myself with Others, a podcast about the life of ideas on and off the page. This is the second episode with the composer and performer and writer, George Lewis. When I first spoke to George Lewis for this podcast, it became rapidly clear that there was no way of confining our conversation to a single episode. George is a man of multitudes whose work ranges across jazz, contemporary classical, electronics, free improvisation, and still other modes of artistic expression. My producer Richard Sears and I decided it was only fitting to let the conversation run a bit longer to encompass the breadth of George's interests, both as a musician and as a thinker. The previous episode ended with George's reflections on cultural appropriation, on the work of Steve Reich and George Friedrich Haas, and in a remarkable turn on the death of Eric Garner. In our second episode with George, we discuss his work as a performer and composer from the early days of his involvement with the AACM to the music that he's been writing for the upcoming Venice Biennale. From the mid-1970s until the early 80s, you were mostly known as a trombonist, and we can talk about what you've called your trombone ambivalence, but you, know, you were playing with Count Basie, you played with Anthony Braxton, played with Steve Lacey, you were also working with European improvisers like Derek Bailey and Evan Parker, but you were already developing into a formidable and original composer. In 1979, you released what, to my mind, remains one of your masterpieces, Homage to Charles Parker. It's a two-part suite. You're playing trombone, Douglas Ewart is on reeds, Anthony Davis is on piano, and Richard Teitelbaum, a dear friend of yours who recently passed away, is on electronics. Can you tell me a bit about how that piece came into being? Uh, well, I have a picture I can share with you at some point, but I guess people can't see that on the podcast. But um, we premiered this piece in Chicago in 1978. And um, I had read somewhere on a liner note uh, for a Miles Davis record where they said he was supposed to be playing a tribute to Duke Ellington, but he didn't play any Duke Ellington pieces. And... And they asked him, well, you didn't play any Duke Ellington pieces, what happened? He said, well, if you're playing good, you're playing, you're making an homage to Duke Ellington, <laughs> which made perfect sense. And so I've been hearing all kinds of homage to Charlie Parker or somebody tries to play like Charlie Parker. And I said, well, I don't know, maybe you don't have to do that. I was doing uh, homemade electronics and sort of, uh, you know, stomp boxes and all that. And I've been listening a lot to Stockhausen's Mikrofoni Eins und Zwei. And uh, so we were using contact mics. That's what the first part is about. You hear the sounds of contact mics and flanging as it's uh, controlling, uh, transforming the sounds of, of, of cymbals. You know, Douglas is bowing the cymbals and, and he's doing percussion stuff. And Richard is doing the synthesizer. And I, don't know if, I don't know if there's a piano in that part at all. And I might be doing something on the electronics with uh, and, and so on. Um, that's what we're thinking of as Charlie Parker's life. Turbulent, difficult, you know, and short. Then there's a transition to his afterlife. And that's the drone, the sort of minimalist drone that you find there. Anthony comes in and they're just two chords, you know, and the two chords alternate. And then Douglas Hewitt comes in. And in the 1978 live premiere on the AACM concert series, a Rata Christina jo Christine Jones, who's now Christina Jones, the dancer. Who was Henry Threadgill's companion at the time. At the time, I think. And she actually dances the afterlife of Charlie Parker. And um, so there's the dance aspect of Charles Parker, and there's the, the iconic uh, alto saxophone aspect of Charles Parker. And then there's a little coda at the end which is my poor attempt to um, do something uh, elegiac in the manner of late Coltrane.
reading somewhere that that had been influenced particularly by John Coltrane's Live in Japan. Oh, all that stuff, everything, the live stuff, you know, welcome. Uh, you know, he had this way of doing it, um, of paying these ballads. They're basically like jazz ballads, but he makes them sound like, um, I don't know, like there's some huge world out there that you have to deal with, and it's incredibly moving. I mean, I was listening to this bootleg or whatever they call it, him playing Lush Life. And I said, well, this is like, and I heard that years after my own sort of attempt to do that Lush Life. And it was like, that's amazing. That's a real, really, he, he takes it to a transcendental realm. Uh, Naima, he, uh, Live in the Village Vanguard again, those kinds of pieces. Uh, you know, and so that's a huge influence. After the rain, dear Lord, I mean, there's so many of them. Well, after the rain, he tries to do it. By the time he gets to like 1965, he's really doing it. And so that's when it becomes transcendental. It floats above everything. But I, I mean, like, that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking about. Around, right after 64, uh, the playing, you know, you hear this in, first of all, the vibrato is out of this world. It's like Korean classical, you know, Korean traditional music, you know, and it's incredibly, affecting you know uh, in a way that see he goes through all these periods i don't want to get into you know, my particular theory of coltrane but um but that's where that era in particular is influencing the, the last little bit of uh, homage to charles parker i think the last movement of a love supreme achieves that effect that's right with 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 and but it even goes further i mean it's it's amazing how much further it goes um you hear it I could, I guess I told you some of the pieces, but those are the ones I keep coming back to, like Peace on Earth, you know, uh, things like that. Um, what is it? Or uh, what is it? The Live in Seattle record where he's doing... Um, and the version of Out of This World on that album is quite extraordinary. Well, in the end, where he comes back with the tenor saxophone, that's an example of it. Or the other track on there where he does Body and Soul, very different from the body and soul of the old days. Very different. I don't know what to say about it. I mean, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. Which is why the man was <laughs> worshipped, you know, JC. This is why he's almost a deity, I think, for a lot of people, understandably. Well, they had that church, you know. Yeah, yeah, the church in San Francisco. But not long after Homage to Charles Parker came out, you had a residency at Pierre Boulez's electronic sound studio, IRCOM, in Paris. I think you were the first African-American composer to work there. I know that Alvin Singleton arrived there later. I don't think Alvin was at IRCOM, but I'll tell you, he did visit and I got to see him. I had dinner with him and Maurice Weddington. That was a nice afternoon. And they, he, uh, Harry Sparr and I, the bass clarinetist, was playing pieces by Alvin and Maurice. Maurice Weddington lives here in Berlin, actually. And um, so we had a nice dinner and went to the Pied de Cochon and stayed out really late. And I got a chance to find out what it was like for black composers living in France, which uh, boiled down to, it was very difficult because there was no sense that, that Afro-Diasporic composers had any purchase on the history of uh, classical music there. 
So it was unusual for me in a number of respects to be there. And people like David Wessel and Todd Macover kind of got me in there. And I spent three years there, actually. Did you get to spend much time with Boulez himself? Not much, but, um, you know, he knew who I was, and I did see him from time to time, and over the years, actually. Had dinner with him a few times and uh, talked about things like virtual scores. And, I mean, you know, I mean, I wasn't as close to him as some people were. But um, there was a lot, there were a lot of people to... Uh, get to know there. Uh, Tristan Murai, Philippe Monnery, Philippe Urel, uh, um, let's see, uh, René Cosse, the, the uh, psychoacoustician, uh, Roger Reynolds was around. I think Fred Laredal might have been there. Um, people visited, like Cecil Taylor visited. and and um, Cecil Taylor came to Earcom? Yeah, he did. Uh, Slide Hampton visited. I got to talk to him too. Yeah, so it was, um, yeah, a lot of people visited. Everyone visited Aircom. It was a pretty interesting place to be. Marcello Mastriani visited. That was fun. <laughs> you developed your Voyager project while you were at Aircom, I believe. It was pre-Voyager. That was the Rainbow Family project. The Rainbow Family. But what were you learning at Aircom in particular? I think I was, I think I was coming of age. You know, I was... 30 years old, basically. Got there in 82, uh, turning 30. Learning about an international kind of way of doing new music. I mean, there are a number of us from the community of interactive computer music people in, um, in the US, you know. Uh, but um, somehow I was the one who went to IRCOM. Well, you do stand out in the AACM, I think, for your explorations of electronic and computer music. I remember a piece by Paul Steinbeck, in which he argued that Voyager uh, and similar electronic pieces uh, that you've written fit into an AACM ethos. I'm not disputing that, but you talked at one point mm -hmm. about a concern that by making music with computers, you could lose your soul because music, as you've said, has historically been a way of affirming a voice that had been silenced, a voice that had been uh, denied. Uh, it was very much tied with the project historically of affirming black humanity. Uh, computer music on the face of it isn't human music, and so I wonder. Did I say that about the soul? You did. That's a quote of yours. Wow. I, I, somebody, they must have had me tied up or something. <laughs> no, never, never talk about the soul. <laughs> I mean, in a way, I'm being slightly facetious, but you know, computer music is about the most stereotypically urological music one can imagine, like the ultimate geek music. And so I'm wondering, uh, were you just immediately drawn to it? Well, you know, think back to 1967 when Muhal made Levels and Degrees of Light. So as far as I could tell, these people really didn't have, they weren't being invited to computer music studios, you know, but they were making it with the materials that were available to them, which is what people do. And so they, Muhal marches into the studio and gets them to turn up the reverb and does all these things, and they don't understand anything about what he's doing, the producers and so on. But it becomes this incredible thing where the bird song, which is an extraordinary piece of minimalist electronic music, like electroacoustic music, made in the studio uh, with no overdubs, just people, and probably, I don't know if there's even a score. I mean, you probably say, well, you do this, Leonard Jones, and you do this, and suddenly wonderful things happen out of that. And, and most of his recordings have some electronic component. And he would talk about you know, Mort Spotnik and these kinds of people in the in the uh, classes, in the ACM music classes. So there was no real issue there about not being interested in electronic music. And then Anthony Braxton introduced me to Richard Teitelbaum. Right. They did those incredible duets. And then later I got introduced to David Behrman. So, yeah, I don't know, the electronic music thing, no, I didn't feel alienated. But, you know, people tried to make me feel alienated, some people. Like, uh, people said things like, I'd say, well, I think I'm going to get a computer and start trying to do stuff like all these people I've seen. They said, well, maybe you should just, um, you know, get someone to help you. I said, I don't know. I, I think I, I don't think I'm 
I think I can do this. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't look that hard to me. And if it is hard, I, I will get someone to help me. But in the end, it wasn't as hard as they said. So a lot of that kind of idea. And even after years of making computer music, for many years, the most frequently asked question I would get, quite apart from how the thing worked, was, did you do it yourself? Because the assumption was that there's had to be some white guy in the back pulling the strings. In the background, who's assisting you, right. Yeah, in some way. And, and you know, the thing is, that's the odd part about that is that you should work in teams. That's what filmmakers do. You know, that's what scientists do. You know, you work in teams. And nowadays, the, the era of the kind of basement bomber like me sitting in a room all by myself and writing thousands and thousands of lines of code. I mean, like, people don't, that'd be crazy to do that now. You know, the, everything's much more, you can't master it all. You know, we're trying to do these machine learning projects now. You know, I mean, sure, I could try to pack that or I could, um, deal with and try to learn about all these other machine learning people who like Nick Collins over there in, uh, in the UK or like who are doing this incredible work. I, the Wekinator, Rebecca Fiebrink. I'd be like, why reinvent that wheel? Instead, there's all this open source stuff now that you draw from the community and that's what creates the art. Just like Janet Will said a million years ago, uh, it's not just this, the, you know, this one lone sort of Beethoven-like figure create, or someone in an artist garret with their computer doing something. I mean, I mean, that's how I did it, but people don't do it that way anymore. There's been a lot of talk in recent years about Afrofuturism, and it's been connected to figures like Jimi Hendrix and Sun Ra and George Clinton. Do you see your work as having anything to do with this Afrofuturist impulse? Do you think the concept has any analytic weight? Sure, I'd love to be an Afrofuturist. <laughs> I've, written, you know, I've written a couple of articles about it. Um, I have a wonderful student, method musicologist right now, who's working on Afrofuturism. And there's been some interesting stuff. I mean, there are a couple of, um, some, a couple of scholars actually put me in that category, which is nice after years of thinking that they used to think that Sun Ra was the only person and so on. Or you could think about Nicole Mitchell or Eddie Harris or um, Miles or... If we're thinking about that engagement with you think it, somehow how Afro diasporic people engage with technology, you could think about Halim El Dab in that way. Um, so Afrofuturism is kind of a, in terms of music, is kind of a growth. Uh, George Clinton. Yeah, there's there's there any number of people going back a really long way, and so we, we, I think there's going to be a new generation of Afrofuturist uh, theorists coming along who are looking at it as being a sort of a rhizomatic development rather than some sort of um, suddenly there's a big bang and when Sun Ra gets a Wurlitzer and then everyone goes out from there, you know. Um, so I think that's starting to go away as a category and people start to see that um, a lot of the fields that maybe some people don't know that much about, there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of interesting engagement with technology. I'm meeting these young Afrofuturist uh, composer technologists like Jessica Ekomane right here in Berlin, French German working at GRM. I mean, like you know, and, and she seems to be experiencing the same things I was back then. Like you know, we're the we're the, always the only one that we see working in the space. You know, so but you know, you get used to that and. Working with technology has enabled me to rethink what improvisation is and to theorizing it in a new way. So Afrofuturism for me becomes a way of um, recasting humanism and using technology to think about, human, think about humanism. We talked earlier about this artificial segregation between the Afrological and the Urological. And I, I, I want to address another problem in the writing of music history that you've also written eloquently about, and it's this myth of absence, the idea that black and other non-white people just weren't present in the creation of concert music. And, you know, you've written about uh, the violinist George Bridgewater, a, a biracial man to whom Beethoven originally dedicated the Kreutzer Sonata. Uh, my sense is that, you, is that as you've become more involved in writing for classical ensembles, you've also written increasingly about African-American and black figures in classical and in experimental music, people like 
uh, William Grant Still, uh, whom we talked about earlier, uh, Julius Eastman, mm. uh, and Benjamin Patterson, a founder uh, of Fluxus, as well as Alvin Singleton and Hale Smith. You're not a booster, but I do have a feeling that you have a commitment to the archival recovery of what had been buried traces of creativity. Well, I once complained about recovery projects, but you, you really need them because there's been so much erasure. I vow, you know, first of all, the myth of absence, I didn't make that term up. That was made up by a former student, uh, the pianist and composer Dana Reason. Uh, she, that was her dissertation. That's one of those dissertations that everyone reads, but which has never been published. It's about actually about women, contemporary women improvisers, and how there's this idea that, well, we don't, we, we can't find anybody because they don't exist, you know, and so you operate on that basis. Um, so, so I kind of felt that that was something, and as far as I could tell, looking on Google and everything, she was the one who made that term up. And, um, and it's gone all over the place now, which I really appreciate, but she should get full credit for it. She wrote a brilliant piece on it. Um, so in a way, I, I made, I sort of made something similar, the cone of silence, but the myth of absence is really much better. You've also said that black composers have experienced what W.E.B. Du Bois called double consciousness. Maybe in the case of someone like Eastman, who's gay, a, a triple consciousness. Uh, I wonder whether in the name of honoring their struggles uh, and in the name of overcoming uh, the erasure that you've talked about, some writers have ended up over-racializing their work and reducing it uh, to a protest against injustice, uh, overlooking the aesthetic ambitions, the, etern the internal qualities of the work. I mean, art isn't autonomous, but it, it's not simply a response to social conditions either. Eastman's work, for example, has a richness that can't be reduced to protest, even if protest is a strong dimension of it. Well, you know, the uh, media artist Adrian Yenick was a good friend of Noah Purifoy, the Af assemblage artist. And she introduced me to Noah, and she took me out to Joshua Tree, and where he had this incredible homemade sculpture park. And the first thing he says is, you're not doing protest art, are you? I'm not interested in protest art. <laughs> <laughs> and you said precisely that's the reason why everything gets mapped onto that and reduced to that and you can't you, you can't see anything else in the work just because it's black people they're supposed to be protesting you know the op my opera was kind of like that somebody said well i thought there's going to be more in it about struggles with the white man and i said well i could do that but then that would be centering the white man and this is actually about black people struggling with their own uh, sense of themselves and how to overcome, how to create a new versions of themselves, how to do self-fashioning and the agency that that's involved in that. Yeah, I mean, for me, working Valerie Cassell Oliver, the curator at the, when she was at the Contemporary Art Museum Houston, brought Ben Patterson for his first big show in many years. And she asked me to write for the catalog, which I did. And then I wrote another piece, which is, uh, for, you know, about that. I continued to work on Ben's work because I began to notice it was just like the Afrological Urological essay. It was like, well, um, I, oh, I know what I want to say. It was about the difference between the public and the private transcripts. I was noticing that in a lot of, um, a lot of experimental music scenes, you know, Fred Moten would say the idea of blackness, the avant-garde, that's like an oxymoron in the making or something. And so, well, the artist accounts, Ben Patterson is right in the center. George Machunas, uh, Emmett Williams, everybody, he's right in the center of things. Then the historians get a hold of it and he disappears. The same thing happened to Norman Lewis, uh, a black painter who was a member of the abstract expressionist circle that gathered at the Cedar Tavern. Well, you know, all kind, it happens with all kinds of people. So I felt like it readdress that public versus private transcript because I wrote Afrological, Urological, and people said, well, Cage, you know, actually thought differently about provisation from what you said. I said, well, that's great, but it's not published. So, I mean, like, maybe you should publish it. But the thing is that it'd be something that people should say if it really happened. So, but, but, because it was certainly said by the artists. So I'm always interested in that discrepancy and how to foreshorten that, that distance. Um, 
So it's not just about homages as, or even recovery, although that's what it ends up becoming because the people do seem to have been neglected in some way. Let's listen for a moment to one of your most impressive recent works, The Will to Adorn. What is the will to adorn? It comes from a phrase by Zora Neale Hurston. She has this essay called Characteristics of Negro Expression. That's from 1937 or something, I think. And, um, and um, she says that this is one of the major characteristics of Negro expression, which means that there is this sense that everything has to be adorned. Nothing can just be left sort of in a plain or undisturbed state. Um, you, she talks about the kinds of artifacts you find in, in black people's homes in the South, like these sort of altar-like structures or when my grandmother had, and it was like, um, you know, there was always a room that nobody went into that had all kinds of pictures. It was really intensely decorated and not just decorated, but recursive layers of decoration, decorating the decoration, as she put it. And so, and that leads to a certain kind of power and you know, incredible sort of, in, like recursion does, right? Recursion is a very powerful thing in computer music. And so it's something that refers to itself and it starts to expand. And the problem is it can get so big that you just uh, can't control it anymore. So it becomes an uncontrollable uh, kind of mode of expansion. So, so that's where the phrase comes from. And that actually, I realized that that could be a principle of composition. You start with one layer, then you keep adorn, keep making adornments, adding new adornments, adding new adornments, and at the end of the day, it ends up being pretty noisy and, and unstable and nonlinear, and that's what that piece really expresses. Rather than rather than trying to say imitate something Zora Neale Hurston might have heard, it was, you know, something like that. Among the works you're going to be premiering in the near future is a choral piece for the Venice Biennale. I'm intrigued by this choral work because the text is drawn from an 18th century philosopher named Anton Wilhelm Amo, who was enslaved as a child in Ghana and brought to Germany. Yeah, Amo uh, was, he was about 20 years older than Kant. And uh, it was amazing, he was enslaved as a child, brought to, Ger brought to Germany, as you say, but he was in this noble family, but they educated him. And he ended up getting his law degree, uh, I think it was, was it either Wittenberg or Halle, one of the two. And then he got a philosophy degree and then he started teaching philosophy in Wittenberg and, and he wrote about human rights, among other things. I think the dissertation is called On the Rights of Moors in Europe. And I don't know, we've got some wonderful philosophers here at the Wissenschaftskolleg that none of them had ever heard of Amo. And how I heard of Amo was through uh, the Savvy Contemporary Gallery here in Berlin. So I'm doing a very interesting thing with this piece. They have something called the Anton Wilhelm Amo Center. And that becomes a repository for scholarship and also becomes a way to support and contextualize the production of new art based on Amo. You know, based on his work, based on you know, site-specific works around where he taught or where he lived. And so one of the gallery directors, uh, the curator um, Bonaventure and Decom, as one of the people who sort of conceived this Amo Center. For, so my piece is going to be an homage to Savvy Contemporary and the Anton Wilhelm Amo Center. It's going to be dedicated to them. Did Kant and Amo ever meet? 
as you know, Kant wrote some ferociously racist things about black people. Well, you know, I mean, that's one of the things. We've been having these wonderful discussions here at the Wissenschaftskolleg on race. And uh, there have been, there've been a lot of articles published in the newspaper just recently. The Neue Zuchert Zeitung wrote something on complaining that people are calling Kant a racist, but that's impossible. His philosophy could, could never have can countenance that, and they should just read him. And, well, we did. <laughs> And uh, know that these awful things being said, particularly in the name of Kant's uh, anthropology. And so even some of the people who are like Kant experts here uh, had to conclude that you know, it wasn't very nice, uh, the things he said. And But he was drawing on a tradition of scientific racism that started perhaps with Linnaeus, because it's not, it's not an internal chain of, of scientific racism. You know, the Greeks, the Romans, they don't have it. You know, not even, you know, medieval Europe has this in the same way. There is a, a, a sort of a nascent notion of um, the w superiority of whiteness, but it's very, un very under-theorized and has nothing to do with science. Uh, so that comes later with Linnaeus and uh, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach and Kant is drawing from them. So, um, so, and of course, Amo, being a little bit older than these people is, are, uh, he's trying to counter this. And so the text is going to be in Latin, the Neue Vocal Solisten. This is one of the most uh, important, uh, I think, groups of vocal groups, you know, maybe ever, and certainly of contemporary music in Europe. It's an incredible group. And so I'm just uh, as amazed. It's for five singers and surrounding electronics, surround sound electronics. So that's... That's, I, it's in its infancy, this piece, because I have a, another piece I'm working on right now, but um, that's all I can really tell you about it. Um, You're also working on a short opera uh, inspired by W.E.B. Du Bois' short story, The Comet, which is about an apocalypse. The two main characters are a black man and a white woman who find each other in the ruins. Yeah. Y you know, Yuval Sharon, who is going who's the director for the piece. It's been postponed. We should have finished it by now, but it's been postponed due to the pandemic. He got in touch one day and said, I'm thinking about double consciousness and what are you reading now? I said, well, I'm reading this short story. I've been reading about Afrofuturism and somehow the comet came up as an example and I didn't know anything about the comet or about another Afrofuturist work that the scholar here, Erica Keese, introduced me to the Princess Steel. So the comet is basically about the Earth passing through the tail of a comet and the gases somehow kill many people. We don't know how many. And uh, these two people, the black man and the white woman, escape because they're not out in the open. And so they come out, they find each other, and then they're, they are under the impression they might be the only two people left on the planet. So what do you do? What do you do under the circumstances in which the veil, as Du Bois would call it, of white supremacy, suddenly becomes lifted? What do you do? Does that um, does that change who you are? Does that change your set of possibilities? Are you prepared to do something that the previous regime could never encounter? That was what they called miscegenation back in the day, to repopulate the earth, um, or do we call that hybridity, like you know, Philippa Duke Schuyler, that kind of thing? Uh, do we? What do we do with that? And one premise of it is that um, white supremacy is sort of encoded in the bodies and minds of these two people, and so they just don't escape it. It's not like everyone is dead so we can do what we want, because it's all sitting there in our bodies. Now, to complicate things a little more, the comet is being performed in tandem at the same time, in, in juxtaposition with the coronation of Popea of Monteverdi's medieval opera, a sort of a... a it's sort of like a pot boiler about ancient Rome and Nero, Neroni, and the schemes of Popea to, uh, to become the wife of Neroni. And um, so that, in a sense, characters in the comet also appear in Monteverdi and vice versa. There's a lot of back and forth between them. They're switching time zones. Uh, it's sort of like maybe it's parallel universes or maybe it's uh, shifting time zones. One could go from interdimensionality, we'll put it that way. And that's, a, that's the form of double consciousness that uh, is being depicted on the stage. So my task, in a way, is to um, try to find a way to negotiate both. And not, again, 
not by quoting from Monteverdi. We don't need to do that. We already have Monteverdi sitting there. But maybe the idea of adopting some of the structural tenets, for example, the continuo sort of motif. So I had to write all these continuos, you know. And uh, so those have become part of the structuration of the piece. And lately, because of working with the American Modern Opera Company, the AMOC, we did some workshops at the Guggenheim about this, virtual workshops. Um, I realized that I could have some sense of real-time situational uh, form music making there, where I didn't have to write absolutely everything, or, or maybe it wouldn't even be a good idea to let people respond to the situation, because actually that's what's happening in Monteverdi too. These continuos, that's the space for improvisation in, in medieval music. So didn't make sense to have my music be all written out and have the Monteverdi be partially improvised. So that opened me up a little bit. And then there's a wonderful librettist, uh, Douglas Kearney, and so this incredible people working on this. Sounds amazing. You've also written about black visual artists like Terry Adkins. I mean, I wrote one piece about um, Jeff Donaldson, but again, I was relating that to these ideas of multi-dominance. I was taking one piece of his uh, jam pack jelly tight for Jamila as a kind of an idea about, you know, steganography in the work because you you see all this incredible multiplicity of colors and everything, like too many, you know, they're all being told as art students that here's the way to go. It's like Rothko and color field and you know, say, no, we don't want to do that. We're doing Kool-Aid colors. We're expressing the multiplicity of what goes on in, in black communities around the world. And then you see that in this one painting, there are like these three figures that pop out. One is Muhal Richard Abrams in the center. He's playing the piano. Another one is Charles Clark, who was an early ACM bass player who passed away. And the third is James Brown. So he's bringing all these people together and imagining what they would sound like if they were all playing in the same band. But Stan, you know, Stan, which I'm writing another essay on him right now, one of the things I'm kind of late with, um, on his, about the general view of his, how he works with music. And Jenny C. Jones, the uh, about how she works with sound and sound art. So I, I tend to think about these things in juxtaposition with with how they work with media. How do you think black composers are doing in comparison? Do you think there's a greater visibility or a greater curiosity about the work that they've produced? Not yet, not yet. Um, I think it's coming. I think it's coming. Y you know, visual art. Let's put it this way. It's a very interesting thing about in the U.S. and maybe I can't, maybe in Europe it might be a little different. There seems to be a, a bit of a disconnect in some scenes between experimental music and visual art. Now, not everyone is doing that, but it seems to be that might be one thing uh, that happens in the black visual arts as well. Do you mean that there's much greater receptivity in our culture towards experimentation in visual art and rather less when it comes to music and sound art? No, I guess what I'm, it's, maybe it's a point of speculation for me. I think there's a lot of interest in black visual art in uh, American and Afro-Diasporic popular music. Um, there's a little less in music that's not as popular. And so that's something that, um, I mean, there's an era the New York school has its sonic analog. I think at some point you get the generation of the Afro, Afro Coper people who were very interested in, in black experimental music of that era. You know, they all drew on Coltrane, you know, uh, Waz or Jar Jarrell and people like this, you know, really tried to express in, in images. And maybe that goes away after a while. And I don't know what's going to replace it. I mean, the generation of composers I've been working with, you know, either they make their own music or they make their own visual art. And maybe I'm thinking that's an, that's something whose time is going to come. Maybe it's a, partly a curatorial thing. Maybe it's something that the right kind of writing can overcome. Like, for example, the amazing collaboration with Glenn Ligon and, um, and Jason Moran. Or, but a lot of the times, people like Arthur Jaffa, who might as well be a, a sound artist himself, you know, that you find that oftentimes when you see kind of weird sounding stuff, 
<laughs> it comes from the artists themselves are making this weird art, like Terry with the archophones or, <laughs> or the electronics he was doing. I mean, when I met Terry Atkins and I saw this electronic stuff he was doing and how he'd play with Eddie Harris, I said, well, this is my guy right here. <laughs> well, I think if that time is coming, you've helped to bring it about, George. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining me on Myself with Others. Thanks a lot, Adam. Wonderful. You've been listening to the second and final installment of George Lewis and Adam Schatz on Myself with Others. Myself with Others is produced by Richard Sears. Thank you to Eric Banks, Robert Boynton, and the New York Institute of Humanities. Thanks as well to New Focus Records. The music on Myself with Others is composed by Richard Sears. Thank you for listening and please subscribe. Thank you.